we all think of Jesus as Lord and Savior. But he's also the master teacher. I think we sometimes forget that Jesus not only is the one that we put our faith in and we trust because he gave himself on the cross, but he is the wisest man who ever lived. That he has insights and uh, information that help us to see the world in a different way and help us to live more fully. The way that Jesus primarily taught is through parables. These, these neat little stories, these word pictures that weren't just a way of conveying facts, but were a way of engaging people's imagination. The point was not just to tell people the way things are or the way things could be, but to help people visualize, uh, to help them experience to help them get a taste of what God was doing in the world. And that's kind of a different thing. When, when our minds are engaged, when we have to kind of figure it out on our own a little bit, it's a little bit different than somebody just telling us something directly. And that's what, and that's what Jesus is all about. He's not about just saying, well, this is the way it's going to be, take it or leave it. Because that's what often happens. People will just leave it. Uh, we, we hear things and we're inclined to, eat, to put them in categories. Where if we hear a fact or a statement, it's, I agree with that, I don't agree with it. And then we're done. And what Jesus is trying to do with the parables is he's trying to move us beyond that. He's trying to move everybody beyond just, I agree or disagree, to what is really going on. To figuring out what is God really doing below the surface in ways that I might not be aware. And so a parable paints this vivid illustration, this mental picture that uses things that are common, things that people would be familiar with, except for us, we have to work a little harder because we're not farmers. We have to work a little harder because when Jesus talks about a first century wedding feast that lasts a week, that's not our experience. We don't, have that, we don't have that experience right there for us. We have to think back to, okay, so how was it really in Jesus' day, and how does this fit with what he's saying, and what would people hear when Jesus said these words? What would, what would be the picture that would come in their minds, not just what would come in our minds? So he uses these, these word pictures to illustrate truths about God, to illustrate what the kingdom of God is really like. And parables always have, you know, kind of a surface meaning, you know, what's, what's going on with the things on the surface. There's seeds, there's a wedding feast, there's uh, a manager managing his, his master's estate. There's the things on the surface that point to some deeper reality about the way that God works in the world. And usually, Usually, Jesus' parables involve something unexpected. That's his way of trying to engage our minds a little bit more. That there's something that just doesn't quite fit. And so we have to, we have to puzzle about it. We have to do a, give it a second look to say, well, what does that really mean? And I think a lot of times we can miss those things because, again, our experience is not the experience of those people that Jesus first talked with. The parable of the sower. And we look at this parable, and especially since we have the explanation, I mean, I think that's the killer. We have the explanation, so we move right to the explanation. We just move straight to the explanation and say, we've got this figured out. You know, there's, there's the seed, and if some of it falls on the, on the path, and so... That those are the people who they, the Satan just pulls the word right out of their lives before they even, they even get it. And okay, there's the one that falls among the weeds, and yeah, the people that have, you know, the people that are just too busy, you know, they're always looking to get another car, they're, they're worried about how the neighbors think of them, and so the word gets choked, we get it, and then, and then we move on. And I think we miss something about the way that God is 
that the people that first heard this would be like, what? What? Really? Because if you think about it, this sower, this farmer, does not act in a way that's very bright, does he? I'm just going to take my valuable seeds that I've carefully preserved all winter and, well, out in the middle of the road. Why not? Why not throw some seeds right in the middle of the road? Oh, look, there's a briar patch over there. Let's throw some seeds in the briar patch. Oh, look, the birds are feeding over there. Let's throw some seed over there where the birds are feeding. Do you think that's the way people really farmed back in the day? I kind of doubt it. I just have this sneaking suspicion that they might have been a little more careful. And Jesus is saying, the way that God operates with God's word, the way that God operates with God's love, is it's all over the place. God is not trying to decide ahead of time, oh, I'm going to share my word with that person because they might be receptive. But I'm not going to share it with that person because it eh, looks like they got a lot of, a lot of things that are going to hamper them from hearing, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to send it over. God just sends his word, sends his love everywhere, to everybody. Because you never know. Jesus is saying, we don't know. If we're going to be the vehicles of God's message, if we're going to be the, the speakers of God's word, if we're going to be the communicators of God's love, it's for everybody. It's just for everybody. Because we certainly don't know. We can't, rec can't recognize who's going to be the hard soil, who's going to be the path, and who's going to bear fruit. And so Jesus says, th and this is the way that Jesus operated, right? Jesus didn't say, oh, you know what, I'm not going to talk to the Pharisees because they're I know they're not going to get it, so I'm not going to talk to any of them. Well, Jesus doesn't talk to any Pharisees, then Nicodemus never becomes a disciple, right? So Jesus operates in this way. And the kingdom of God that Jesus is, is talking about in these parables, that's the, main, that's the main message. If you wanted to say, well, what's, what's Jesus primarily communicating about in his parables and in his whole teaching ministry? It's this idea of the kingdom of God. And that's another thing that we, I think, tend to not quite when we hear the words kingdom of God so, or, or, or kingdom of heaven, a lot of times we tend to think of heaven, right? That place where God is in control. We think of the place where we go after we die, where things are right. Or we think of that time somewhere far in the future where God is going to clean up this mess that we're in and make things the way that God wants them to be. And there's some, you know, there's some truth to that. But the way that Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the heavens is he always says it's at hand. It's at hand. It's among you. It's within you. This kingdom is, is very, very close. And it's continually breaking in to our world. Uh, Dallas Willard, who was a great Christian philosopher. He wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy. And he talked about how the way that these words are used, it really, is, it really isn't kingdom of heaven, it's kingdom of the heavens. And in the, in the worldview of, of ancient times, there was this sense in which heaven was kind of just permeating our world so that it, it was just beyond our sight, just beyond our hearing, just beyond what we could perceive, but it was always on the verge of breaking in, that God was always on the verge of breaking in to our reality. And that's what Jesus is talking about, and that there are places where God does break in and change things and make things the way God wants them to be. And I think that does happen. That does happen. And one of, the, one of the ways that uh, Jesus talks about this, he says, well, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. 
And again, we think we get this one, right? So that the, that, that, that the kingdom starts really small and tiny and then makes this nice little tree where the birds go and live. And we miss one of the points of it because in Jesus' time, mustard was a weed. So it's kind of a noxious thing. You wouldn't want it in your garden. You wouldn't want it around. And yeah, it's kind of a big weed that birds come and perch in. You know, birds that will come and eat the other things on your crops. So he's saying, yes, it's a, it's a little thing that gets big, but it's also a surprising thing. Something that we might not think is the way that God would work turns out to be exactly the way that God breaks into the world and starts to change it. So the kingdom of God breaking into our world, where could we see it today? I don't know, but I think it's happening, or I think at least it could happen. That maybe, despite the, the terrible way that things look and the pessimism that we all feel sometimes, maybe, maybe this is the time that our country is going to take another step forward toward racial justice. It could happen. The kingdom could break in that way. I mean, maybe despite the fact that we look around this world and it seems like there's no peace anywhere, that there's all kinds of violence, but maybe this is the time when God's kingdom will break into the world and bring more peace. I don't know. But God does work in surprising ways. And every time Jesus talks about God's kingdom, it's a surprise. And so I pray that we will be surprised by what God will continue to do in our lives and in our world. Thanks be.